Hi, y'all. This is going to be my last video on the transgenders in the military for a while, unless something comes up. And I want to address a particular objection that I see with some, deg some degree of regularity, and that is about the fact that, uh, oh, you're stereotyping against transgender people. You are generalizing about, stere uh, about uh, transgender people. It's not true of all transgender people. All of this is true. Uh, you are judging them. Absolutely true. Uh, we are judging them based on... Uh, are they fit or are they not fit? What are their relative? What's the relative fitness, or what are, what's our best guess about their relative fitness versus their relative unfitness? What are the uh, risks and liabilities that come with them, and what are the benefits? What you know, what are we going to get out of it for incurring this liability? And yet, so it's all true: stereotyping, generalizing, judging, absolutely true. And people seem to think that after they have said that you are stereotyping X, they have presented an argument that means something. And that's because of this widespread false belief that stereotyping is inaccurate. It is not. It is more accurate, on average, than uh, sociological and psychological models. Sociological and psychological modeling has been going on for more than a century. And they still suck. Really bad. And to give you an idea of the relative uh, benefit or the relative accuracy of stereotyping, base, unrefined stereotyping, versus following what psychologists and sociologists will tell you, is that fewer than 5% of all psychological and sociological theories have a correspondence between what the theory predicts and what you see in the world. Uh, fewer than 5% of them have a correspondence of over 0.5. Most of them have a correspondence of about 0.2, which means 80% uh, of the data is not where it's supposed to be. Whereas, unrefined stereotyping, just following your, your best guess, your instincts, your common sense, uh, you know, that kind of thing that we all do every single day has a, a correspondence between what our intuition tells us and what happens, the observations you're going to see in the world of about 0.8, which means that uh, it 80% of the data lies where it's supposed to, and 20% of the data uh, are not where they are supposed to be, whereas it's uh, the opposite generally in psychology and sociology. 80% of the data is not where they say it's supposed to be, and only 20% is where they uh, say it's supposed to be. For most of it, there are some that have a correspondence of better than 0.5. The worst of stereotypes have a correspondence of about 0.4. So the worst types of stereotypes, the ones that are the, the least accurate, are still more accurate than the majority of psychological and sociological theories. Bear that in mind. It's one of the biggest myths that psychologists and sociologists love to peddle to persuade. You know, you'll see them get on the, uh, the news stations. They love to persuade people that they are experts. Oh, we have an expert in X. We have an expert in Y. We have an expert in Z. And they'll call them scientists. Oh, you're a social scientist. That's why they want the word science uh, or scientist stuck to uh, the word social. It's to give them the credibility. They can't get through the actual uh, work products that they produce. Uh, because people generally trust physics, they trust biology, uh, medical science a little bit less, but they generally trust that. Uh, the, you know, the, the natural sciences people pretty much trust by and large because uh, they're really good about catching their errors and correcting them and doing it publicly, uh, owning their shit when they get it wrong, and really putting in the, the rigor that is required to stop fooling yourself into believing that you have uh, found something that exists when all you've been chasing really is uh, you know your imagination and oh well, but I got into this rabbit hole and look what it is <laughs> it's the ghost of my imagination staring back at me my bad they really do put in the effort by and large the social sciences do not uh, and indeed it, there is a selection bias against trying to impose rigor within these fields uh, the senior uh, scholars are not all that keen or at least may, maybe they're changing now but um, I'm over the last 30 years. Uh, they have not been particularly keen on new upstarts challenging them, and they will try to use the bully pulpit of their position in the pecking order to squash uh, you know, noisy under uh, noisy grad students and postdocs and whatnot who really want to bring rigor in uh, into these fields. Not all of them are equally as bad; some are better than others, but they all have a rigor problem. Now, <clears throat> because there are failure rates. And no matter what you do, you're going to get some things wrong. You just have to accept that. So why is it uh, that stereotyping works better than psychology and sociology in helping you navigate uh, your daily life? One of them is what your intuition is uh, meant to do versus what it is psychology and sociology uh, claim to be trying to do. One of them is statistical, uh, statistically analytic, uh, um, I don't know, analyses of the, of the world. 
They're trying to use the tools of mathematics, which is not primarily what our brain is designed to do, uh, in order to model certain things. And uh, you, you know, you have, so that's that. Your intuition is designed to be prudent. It's not designed to give you logically airtight arguments. That requires a great deal of work. If you have to sit down and write a logical proof, you have to put a lot of effort into it. When there is danger afoot, you don't have to give it a great deal of thought. That kind of thing is built into you. Every, uh, you know, walk out into the field sometime and, or watch a nature show, because they, you, know, you don't have to sit around and wait for hours and hours and hours for some animal to happen by on the nature show, because they cut out all the waiting. And watch uh, what happens when you have like a prey animal drinking water or, I don't know, licking his hoof or whatever, and a predator comes by. Um, there is an alert distance, which is larger than the flight or escape distance. And the alert distance, as the name implies, is where you start to take notice that you are in a situation that could turn bad quickly. And then as uh, the distance is closed to the target animal in this case, uh, there is a threshold uh, within, uh, beyond, beyond which barrier you can stay and they won't run. And then if you cross it, they will, they will flee. That's the escape distance, is how close you can get to that animal before uh, it runs away. Now, the animal doesn't sit there and think about, oh, well, okay, 25 meters is my limit, buddy. You come one step closer and I'm out of here. It, they, they don't, in case you don't know, they really don't do that. Uh, I promise you that the nature shows are not editing out the part where the fox <laughs> draws diagrams and you know, an attack pattern and then the little deer is sitting there or whatever it is. You know, the fawn is sitting there at the, at the creek, you know, lapping up some water, playing with its hoof, looking for the berries. And it's like calculating the distance from, you know, the, the woods or whatever to where it is. And it's going, okay... Uh, when I guess to, when line of departures here, once that happens, game on, got to go. That isn't what happens. There is a cost and a benefit to remaining at your watering hole or eating your berries or whatever, and running away. And animals, uh, po you have to think about populations here because um, it's populations that change over time. Uh, that's what evolution is. It's not individuals that change into something they weren't before, and. A, a, uh, a species that has uh, a lot of members that flee too precipitously will go extinct. And uh, a species that has a lot of members that don't flee uh, when they're supposed to will also go extinct. So there is a pressure on either side. And the reason for it is this. There is a benefit to waiting the extra five feet to get a little bit more nutrient uh, you know, from your berries or a little bit more water from your hydration, a little bit more energy uh, or whatever it is. Uh, and so if you wait that extra five feet, you get a, a slight increase in the, the, of your resources. Whereas if you left a little bit earlier, you are depriving yourself of getting that resource. You are not conserving energy as efficiently as you might. And you know, the, the vicissitudes of nature have a way of weeding out the people who are too wasteful. I'm sorry, the populations of creatures that are too wasteful and the ones that aren't sufficiently prudent. So you have to be both prudent, but not, uh, well, prudent is careful. You can't be wasteful, and you also can't be too uh, too st uh, stingy with, with things. You, you've got to find that happy medium as a prudent matter. With respect to our estimates about what our relative risks are in relation to various other groups or uh, subpopulations, it's, it's intuitive largely, but it works. A species that, uh, <clears throat> okay, a species has to be able to differentiate between uh, tr uh, threats and non-threats, and it will do so imperfectly. So you will have some, uh, some categories of, of things you perceive to be threats that aren't, and then you will have some category of things that you don't perceive to be threats, which in fact are. The ones that are most sharply uh, deadly are, the, are where you fail to perceive a threat when one actually exists, whereas uh, there is a cost to perceiving a threat when no cost exists, but it's not as sharp. If you, if you run um, a little, uh, if you, if you, uh, you know, the five feet example I used, I think, if you leave too early, you are missing, uh, you are missing an opportunity to uh, conserve energy. You can do that a little bit and still survive. If you fail to flee when you should, the prey will catch you and you're dead. So one is, is more, uh, sharp. That's why you get a feeling of fear when, when something is getting close to you. Whereas you don't get an intense feeling when the opposite is happening. That is the alarm that is designed, that is built into you, because if you don't have that, you will fail to react to a threat that actually exists, and the consequences of that are much more severe, much more immediate, than failing to budget your resources perfectly well. But there is a constraint on either side. 
Now, the progressives will take uh, the kernel of an argument that you should not, uh, stereotyping can be bad, you know, we should try to avoid stereotyping uh, to the extent that we can and try to find out what's true. Yeah, that's a good idea. But the assumption that they make is that stereotyping is generally unreliable, which is just false. It's generally reliable. So here, you have a group of people, in this case, uh, normal people, and then you have a group of people who have some psychological abnormality. <clears throat> By the way, saying that it's atypical or saying that it's abnormal doesn't mean that you're bad people or anything. It's not a slight. It's, it is an, uh, a statement <clears throat> about the, the, uh, the ensemble differences between two groups. You have something that clusters around normal and something that doesn't close, cluster as uh, closely around normal, and the things that don't uh, cluster as closely as other things are more abnormal. They are less typical and therefore they are more atypical. They're atypical. So <clears throat> you have the, the norm, which is you know, this bubble of people, and then out here you have some, some variations, and then out here you have other variations. And somewhere along there is where we start drawing the line between uh, not perfectly normal, but also not too abnormal to really be a problem, uh, to present any real issues that we need to worry about. And then a little further out, we start drawing the line saying, you know, somewhere in this area, it's so abnormal that it actually becomes hazardous. And one of the ways that we do that is by how infrequently a given something arises uh, in, in the population. Gay people have a particular uh, proportion of uh, a particular prevalence in the general population. Transgender people have a general uh, a particular pre uh, prevalence in the population. They're not the same. Straight people have a particular prevalence in the population too. Uh, in fact, most it's mostly them. And so you've got like mostly straights, and then you've got gays, and then you've got transgender. The difference between gay and transgender and their prevalence in the population is much larger than the difference between gay and straight. So another way to say that is that being transgender is uh, very far away from normal, and though gay is away from normal, it's not as far away from normal. It's closer to normal than it is closer to trans the uh, degree of abnormality that attends being transgender. And when you get further and further and further and further away, it becomes uh, there becomes a uh, a better reason for people to be suspicious, to have the alarm. Uh, and then if you go sufficiently far, like into the axe murderer phase, that's where you start getting in. You really want to start uh, widening your flight distance so <laughs> it matches your alarm distance. That's just built into us. It is imperfect. But if you take the opposite approach and say the other, the other option on, on the table, which is psychology, you're going to fail more frequently. The problem in both camps, though, is that they are looking at groups. And when you look at groups, you're looking at aggregate trends, and they don't tell you anything about particular people. Uh, and this is where the leftists and the progressives uh, like, and politi like politicians like to focus on what happens between one individual and one other individual. That also will not model the, popu the population you're studying. Um, and the problem with doing it on the, uh, the basis of what one individual versus another individual are like is that you get to choose which individuals to use as the representation that best suits you. You get to cherry pick, which is uh, you know why if you want to talk about white people, you can choose, I don't know, a Hitler or I, uh, you know, Mother Teresa, I suppose. Depending on how you want to try to paint that given group, you can choose uh, really you know, what are perceived to be really great examples and what are really bad examples uh, to press your particular point. Whereas if you just look at the, the group behavior, it's a little bit different. But you have to understand when you look at the group behavior, it doesn't actually predict anything about any particular person in that group. So, and simultaneously, knowing something about any two particular people in a group tells you nothing about the group itself. So, using a person is not an exam is not going to be representative of the trend of the group. So, the the difficulty there is trying to balance those two. And when you want to do it uh, for logical reasons, inductive reasons, the the endeavor in psychology is inductive. So you never get necessary conditions. You just get more likely, seemingly more likely, seemingly less likely than the alternative. Um, but what you get there is the problem of uh, the logical problem of, of trying to say something about an individual that isn't necessarily true about that individual. 
And that's how a lot of people hear it when you say something about a group. If you say transgender people have this general trend, you will get responses like, well, what about this one? I said transgender people generally have this trend, pointing out that this person does not follow the general trend, does not say that the general trend doesn't exist. All it says is that the general trend is not 100% accurate and you have found an exception. Congratulations. I'm very glad you're able to notice when something is very far removed from the general trend. Curiously enough, you're able to point out uh, you're, able, you're, you're able to spot trends and their variances there, uh, but when it comes to normal versus abnormal, suddenly, oh, I, who can say? Anyway, uh, so in the uh, sciences, and even the social so-called sciences where they try, they pretend to try to do this, and sometimes it, uh, you get it right, it's, a, it's an analytic endeavor. Whereas in something like the military, it's a prudent issue. It's not a logical issue. It is prudent to uh, hedge your bets. It's prudent to eliminate risks that are unnecessary to take. The people on the left and the progressives who want to push this on the military <clears throat> are very cavalier about the, uh, the lives of the soldiers who are going to be negatively affected by introducing, by forcing this element among them, uh, on, I'm sorry, on them. The, the people, who, if, you, if you think about the, what it is that a soldier's job is, the soldier's job is to die on command at, at the bottom of the day. It's, there'll be some particular goals in mind. There'll be someone in power over him who can tell him to go do this. And even if the person knows that it will result in his death, he still has an obligation to go do it. Uh, simultaneously, the, uh, the, the uh, higher, rank, higher ranking generals and their subordinate commanders have an obligation to make sure that when they give a command to go do something that they know is going to get their soldiers killed, that it's for uh, an important reason. You don't go around throwing away the lives of your soldiers needlessly. And, and this doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you're compassionate about whether or not you truly care about your soldiers as individuals. It's simply a prudent requirement. If you are wasteful with the lives of your men, then you will find that in a very short period of time you have run out of men who are still living to be able to throw out a problem when one really arises that needs to be addressed. So wh whatever the motivations of a general are, whether or not he's a bleeding heart, whether or not he's you know, uh, a marionette, whatever it is, the prudent pressure is still there. You can't recklessly throw away your soldiers' lives uh, very often or you're not going to have any of them left. So you have to be responsible. And when it is you say, this particular thing is worth you know, X many deaths. And in this case, I haven't heard a single transgender person say, it is perfectly okay if a thousand soldiers uh, have to be sacrificed in combat so that way I can join the military. Or one soldier has to die so I can join the military. They won't say it. What they, what they deny is that there is any risk or any substantial risk that comes with having them at all. It's simply not true. And the reason that you have this aversion is simply because of our instincts, a stereotype that there is a threat there. And if you look at the data and don't try to like paint it through some feminist progressive lens where, you know, Whatever is convenient for what I'm thinking at the moment is what the data necessarily has to mean. And actually look at the trends and the data. It's quite clear. There is a risk there. There is a threat. You will incur deaths thereby. And if you're going to incur those deaths thereby, you had fucking better well make sure that they are worth uh, the cost. You had better make sure that you were prepared to write a letter to those soldiers' parents and say, Hey, dear mom, dear dad, uh, little Billy is dead. Uh, for no particular reason. I was just trying to appease the political whims of a group of whiny and very active and well-funded uh, people who wanted to, uh, to partake in entryism. Lots of love, General Fuck You. You had better be prepared to write that letter because you will be writing, well there will be letters being sent to the soldiers' families, but I doubt they're going to be written quite that way. And the uh, another thing about the way that people interact with their stereotypes versus the individuals is that when there is very specific and concrete individuating information people abandon the stereotype so if there are uh, whenever you want to persuade someone that uh, this is a bad stereotype or that the stereotype uh, shouldn't be applied here it's the same way you would do in any other field in science you'll say yes there's a general trend here's an exception to that general trend here are the data that prove it or that uh, imply it and here are the tools at your disposal to uh, be able to reliably test for it uh, so that way you aren't being led astray by some kind of cognitive error. But the tool on offer here that is claimed to be uh, able to be put into the system 
is one that is fundamentally not fit for purpose. More than a century now they've been practicing psychology and sociology and they still can't do better than our base unrefined naturalistic instincts on a whole host of things. Uh, so you have that problem. Yeah, um, we don't have infinite resources. We have to make prudent decisions uh, because the failure to do it will, re will result in people's deaths. And quite frankly, uh, the life of one soldier is far more important to me than the feelings of some transgender people who want to have a sense of belonging in an organization. Outside of the military, it's going to be a different calculus because the, uh, the consequences of making different decisions aren't as severe in the same way that running away slightly too early from your food or your water uh, is a waste of energy, but the uh, consequences aren't as immediate and sharp as would be if you waited too long to run away when a predator is approaching you. And that's the balance, that's, uh, that, that's the psychology that's at work here. And those are what you have to contend with. And if you don't like it, tough shit. Have a great day.